Foot infantry has two principal means of action, fire and movement. There must be the closest coordination between them in order that infantry may close with the enemy and break his resistance. Fire destroys or neutralizes the enemy, and must be used to protect all movement in the presence of the enemy not masked by cover, darkness, fog, or smoke. Through movement, infantry places itself in positions which increase its destructive powers by decrease of the range, by the development of convergent fires, and by flanking action. Squad-based fire and maneuver, a term used interchangeably with fire and movement at the time, was U.S. doctrine during World War II. If you've seen my first few videos, you'll remember the Rifle Squad was both organized and trained to conduct independent fire and maneuver, and it worked just fine in training. But as the old training mantra put it, the battle is the payoff, and World War II battle resulted in startling attrition. The infantry branch incurred over 80% of the army's casualties, and the vast majority of those losses were in the rifle companies, where there was a staggering turnover of personnel. There were rifle companies that sustained 400% casualties in their first six weeks in Normandy. That means from D-Day to mid-July, those units had to replace their full TONE strength four times. As a result, squad-based fire and maneuver proved to be a capability that rapidly eroded in combat. Squads that landed as cohesive, well-oiled machines became shattered, hollow patchwork units in no time. Before long, men who had arrived in theater as privates were leading squads, chronically understrength squads. Some favored an increase in firepower to offset the relentless attrition. In a 1946 letter to the editors of the Infantry Journal, a staff sergeant advocating for the formal adoption of a second automatic rifleman in the rifle squad recounted his own experience. Theoretically, the 11 M1s in the squad give the leader enough firepower but after the first day of action, the squad leader would be lucky to have the BAR and four or five riflemen. The second half of the fire and movement team always seemed to be MIA after the initial action. A second BAR would be that second half. Even when the squad was brought back up to full strength, it was composed mostly of replacements, many of whom arrived shortly before their squad received the warning order for its next attack. Most replacements who arrived from an IRTC in the States had been relatively well trained after a 17-week training cycle, but had little time to integrate into their new units. The 1944 iteration of the Mobilization Training Program for Replacement Riflemen, MTP 7-3, devoted 94 hours of instruction on the subject, tactics of the rifle squad and platoon. Comparing that to some other important skills, it was right up there with rifle marksmanship, which was allotted 103 hours, and nearly double the 48 hours devoted to the operation of patrols. Three times as many training hours were set aside for squad and platoon tactics as compared to the tactical training of the individual soldier, which was given 31 hours. Small unit tactics became an increasing focus of replacement training. They knew the fundamentals, but there was rarely opportunity to get to know each other. Ideally, they'd reach their new unit when it was in reserve, and several divisions established reinforcement battalions to properly absorb replacements. Major General Fred L. Walker noted, Enlisted infantry replacements have been satisfactory, however I have found it necessary to give them an orientation course prior to placing them in battle. The orientation course used in the 36th Division included such subjects as small unit problems, firing of weapons with which the men are armed, battle drill to develop teamwork, and patrolling under various conditions. This training is conducted by officers and non-commissioned officers from the companies to which the replacements are assigned. The instructors later become the leaders in battle. But owing to the vicissitudes of war, a lot of these guys were dropped in a hole on the line in the middle of the night. This was neither fair to the reinforcements nor to the organization. The reinforcement system did not operate to allow time to build up esprit, or to contribute to that close personal teamwork so necessary for success on the battlefield. According to the minutes of the Conference on the Infantry Division, Major General Walter Robertson, who had commanded the 2nd Infantry Division, said, you have got to have some system in your organization to let you integrate the men into your organization. It is fundamentally wrong to replace men on the front lines. It is unfair. To which General Patton bluntly added, It's murder. Compounding this problem, the need for infantry replacements eventually exceeded what the IRTCs could provide. Late in the war, this shortfall was covered by converting soldiers from non-infantry units into infantry replacements after six weeks of retraining. These men were earmarked for additional on-the-job training once they reached their new units because it was understood six weeks was not enough time to turn an expert anti-aircraft artilleryman into an expert infantry rifleman. And naturally, units that were forced to shed men for infantry conversion felt no obligation to shake off their best and brightest. 
While they only constituted a minority of reinforcements, some rifle units received a glut of these less than satisfactory retrainees, leading a couple platoon leaders in the 34th Infantry Division to report. The type of men which we are receiving as replacements at present is very poor. It seems that every man that is incompetent in other type units is put in the infantry. Half of my platoon at present has had different training than that of an infantry rifle company. Given these circumstances, there were influential voices in the army who felt that fire and maneuver at the squad level quickly became impossible, as summarized by the following opinion presented at the big post-war infantry conference at Fort Benning. In combat, fire and movement is a platoon job. Squad fire and movement is a refinement which cannot be applied in prolonged combat when the life expectancy of a trained squad is as short as we found it to be. Wars are won by platoons. The attack of a rifle company is the attack of three platoons, each with its own objective. Here is where fire and movement commences. So let's look at how a rifle platoon fought. According to a July 1944 article in the Infantry School mailing list, A rifle platoon's job in combat is simple, although it is far from easy. A platoon performs no classic evolutions on the battlefield. It does just three things during battle. Move, attack, hold. It also observes, reconnoiters, fires, and secures itself against surprise, but it does these things in the normal course of events while performing its three basic operations. To move, to attack, and to hold. Moreover, it always performs each of these functions according to certain rules which never change, regardless of terrain, weather, or time. Instead of focusing on the established steps of the offensive covered in my squad tactics video, the assembly area, crossing the line of departure, deployment, the firefight, advancing the attack with fire and movement, etc., the previously quoted article enumerated what it called a platoon's combat phases. That article and those phases form the backbone of this video. And the first vertebra is Phase 1, Contact with the Enemy Unlikely. The platoon leader is reasonably certain of arriving at his immediate objective without meeting serious resistance. Therefore, speed is his first consideration. The platoon will march on roads, trails, and open, firm ground where it can move easily and speedily, but it will take no chances of being surprised by a small enemy group. The platoon leader provides all-around security by means of scouts, small patrols, and designated observers to the front, flanks, and rear. Phase 2. Contact expected, but enemy location unknown. The platoon leader expects to meet the enemy at any time during the march, but he has no immediate indication of the enemy's presence. He is now less concerned with speed than with readiness for combat. He follows concealed routes wherever possible. He further deploys his squad so that they are ready to maneuver rapidly, to hit hard and fast. This deployment also gives the platoon more dispersion and incidental protection from small arms and artillery fire. I've gone over the platoon's organization elsewhere, but in short, the rifle platoon was the smallest unit to have the triangular organization common to most infantry units, which is to say it was primarily composed of three interchangeable maneuver units. The platoon had three rifle squads. One could fire, one could move, and one could provide security and act as a reserve or a support, as it was known during World War II. Unless the platoon zone of action and the strength of the enemy immediately in its front is so great that all the platoon's firepower is required at the start of the attack, the platoon leader should initially hold one rifle squad in support as a maneuvering element. The platoon is now in fighting formation. It avoids exposed danger areas, but pushes on as rapidly as possible, consistent with concealment and readiness to fight. The platoon leader doesn't know whether the enemy is 500 yards or 2 miles away. Therefore, the platoon's advance is delayed only as much as is necessary to avoid surprise. To the point about avoiding exposed danger areas, say the leading squads were skirting the edges of a field using the trees of a hedgerow as concealment, the support squad wouldn't waltz through the open to maintain a geometrically perfect V when they could trail one of the leading squads at a distance. So, as mentioned previously, the platoon utilized terrain wherever possible to maximize cover and concealment, that is not always illustrated in these videos for the sake of clarity, but it should always be kept in mind. If you'd like to know more about the platoon's approach march techniques, I encourage you to watch my Rifle Platoon Formations video. It also covers the maintenance of march security and the conduct of platoon scouts. It's basically an entire video devoted to Phase 2. So we'll be moving right along to... Phase 3. Enemy presence known, but aimed small arms fire not encountered. The platoon leader knows the enemy is near, probably with an effective range of small arms fire. There is a strong possibility that the platoon will have to fight within the next few hundred yards. 
There are various ways in which a platoon leader may know of the enemy's nearby presence, by sight, sound, smell, actions of civilians or animals, or less frequently, intelligence reports from higher units. During this phase, the platoon could be subjected to some small arms fire, but didn't open fire until forced to by the enemy. Bursts of unnamed fire into the platoon's vicinity may have been directed at a nearby unit, and returning fire would alert the enemy to the platoon's presence. Even if the enemy suspected their presence, they may not have known its exact location or strength, and a premature firefight would stymie the advance, waste ammunition, and allow the enemy to pinpoint the platoon's position. There is only one thing for the platoon leader to do, and that is to continue to move toward his objective, using the most covered route available, until the leading elements can locate the enemy blocking the approach to the platoon objective. When this group has been located accurately enough to engage with effective small arms fire the area which it occupies, the platoon will be in a position to make a coordinated attack using fire and maneuver, and not before then. The platoon continues to move with caution and silence. A patrol of from four men to one squad precede the bulk of the platoon. The patrol advances by infiltration, with some men always in firing position ready to engage any enemy who may appear. Every advantage is taken of natural concealment. The platoon leader keeps the remaining squads far enough back to ensure that they will not be pinned down by fire directed at the leading patrol. The base squad furnishes the leading security element. In the attack, the leading security element normally becomes part of the base of fire. A lack of enemy fire was no assurance that the platoon's location or intentions were unknown. An enemy may have been sitting back, waiting for a target to fill up his sights. If his local outposts have sighted the platoon, and it is apparent that he is lying in wait with finger on the trigger, secrecy ceases to be of prime importance. The platoon advances just as before, except that every movement by an element of the platoon is covered by a good volume of fire from the remainder. This is area fire, for the platoon has not yet seen and located the enemy. It consists simply of firing or throwing hand grenades into every place of concealment that may hide an enemy. Supporting fires of automatic weapons, mortars, and artillery, if the platoon leader can obtain them, are directed on areas to the front and flanks where the enemy is suspected or known to be. I know that's a bit stereotypical of U.S. forces, but you can see what the infantry school was actually teaching infantry platoons at the time. If you think the enemy may be present, don't hesitate to request a fire mission. Lighting up suspicious locations before initiating movement in the hope of transforming concealed enemy troops into acquired targets was known as reconnaissance by fire. It was defined by the U.S. Army as reconnaissance by fire, search for an enemy position by firing on his probable position and thus drawing his fire. This didn't mean unleashing an earth-shaking fusillade to saw the trees down. It was sufficient for everyone to pump in a few rounds to see if anything moved, screamed, or fired back. As stated in the first post-war volume of the infantry school mailing list, when contact was likely and the distance to the next key point was short, the alternate method of reconnaissance by fire should be considered before a bound is made. It is the exceptional enemy who has been trained to the point that he will withhold fire when a few well-placed shots are fired at his position. Frequently, he will reply, thinking his position has been discovered. Wartime reports from the front highlighted the efficacy of the reconnaissance by fire technique when discussing the need to better instill its importance into fresh replacements. Reconnaissance by fire is unknown to them. They thought they might waste ammunition. They should know when they reach us that it is better to expend ammunition on positions that are not occupied than fail to cover it and learn later that it was occupied. The platoon leader thus continues the advance by short, cautious bounds in the assigned direction toward the assigned objective. Phase 4. Aimed small arms fire encountered, but enemy not located. The leading elements are now receiving effective rifle and automatic fire. They have been seen by the enemy. When individuals or small groups get up or try to move, hostile fire is promptly directed at them. This fire comes from several directions. The general direction of each enemy weapon can be determined from its sound, but the platoon leader cannot see and locate any of these weapons. This is a normal situation, for both the Japanese and the Germans are skillful at concealing muzzle blast by firing through bushes and buildings, and their powder smoke is difficult to see except from extremely close range. If a patrol is attacked, the man who first observes the enemy calls out the direction of attack, front, right, left, or rear. Patrol members face in the direction called to meet the threat. Upon enemy contact, the platoon leader used his handy 536 radio to send a report to the company commander. He let the old man know what all that shouting and shooting was about, where they'd run into trouble and his intended course of action. It's up to you to keep in touch with your commanders and supporting units. That's where communications come in. 
They must know exactly where you are at all times to coordinate the attack. Then they'll back you up where and when you need it most. A platoon's eye view of combat training assumes the reader is familiar with the so-called four F's of fighting, which during World War II usually stood for find them, fix them, fight them, and finish them. Some texts of the era include others, most commonly fending. For example, the pre-war editions of the ROTC Manual, a textbook for the Reserve Officers Training Corps produced by the Military Service Publishing Company, listed what it called the Illiterate Summary of the Phases of Combat. It said, in order to accomplish a mission of destruction, a unit out of contact finds, fixes, fights, and finishes the enemy, fending all the while. Fending means preventing the enemy from finding, fixing, fighting, and finishing you. It wasn't a separate step, but something that was done during each of the four main Fs. Lieutenant Colonel Fred L. Walker Jr., who had commanded the 1st Battalion of the 143rd Infantry Regiment in combat, provided a brief summary for each F. Find it. The combat infantryman in the assault must know the exact location of the enemy weapons which are shooting at him before he can point them out or destroy them with his own weapons. The bulk of the tactical targets on the ground during World War II were definitely spotted only when the combat infantrymen got close enough to locate them by the sound of their firing, by vision at very short range, and by an intelligent study of the ground. Fix it. The combat infantrymen closing in on an individual enemy must keep him and all other nearby enemy weapons under fire so that they can neither escape nor assist each other by fire and movement. Fight it. The commander must maneuver his troops and weapons into close grips with defending troops in order to assault and destroy them with every available means. The combat infantrymen must penetrate into enemy positions in order to find and destroy those enemy troops and weapons which could neither be located from a distance nor be destroyed by long-range artillery and bombardment. Finish it. The commander must continue the attack until the entire hostile area has been searched out and occupied, until all resistance by enemy forces has ceased, and until all enemy personnel are disarmed. The combat infantryman must not only destroy the defenders whom he sees, but he must also search out every nook and cranny of each hostile position to be sure that no hidden enemies remain. Furthermore, he must continue to guard the position to prevent the enemy from returning to reoccupy it. And yes, he too adds, fend against it. While one combat infantryman attacks the enemy to his front, others are watching his flanks and rear to prevent enemy fire or movement from an unexpected direction. Find them, fix them, fight them, finish them. So the first priority of a combat leader was to find them. The platoon leader must find the enemy. Until that is done, he can only continue the line of action started in phase three, covering all movement with fire. Supporting fire by machine guns, mortars, and artillery is requested on all areas from which hostile fire is coming. Each time that such supporting fires come down, the platoon moves forward promptly, taking instant advantage of the assistance which they provide. The platoon leader may strengthen the leading patrol to enable it to push ahead more aggressively, with increased firepower. In a coordinated attack, the platoon advanced as far as possible covered only by supporting weapons. When this fire was unavailable or had to be lifted, or the volume of enemy fire was too intense to be ignored, the platoon needed to attack with fire and movement using its own organic weapons. Rifle squads and platoons advance without firing until they are forced by effective hostile small arms fire to advance by fire and movement, or until they arrive within effective small arms range, 200 to 400 yards of the enemy, and are exposed to enemy observation. Thereafter, the rate of fire should be moderate, just enough to support the advance and the advance must be as rapid as possible to reduce the time of supporting fires to a minimum. In each firing position, the platoon leader endeavors to establish fire superiority over the enemy. The platoon leader calls for fire support when necessary. He selects advanced firing positions and takes advantage of every diminution in the effectiveness of the enemy's fire to push forward. The attack of the platoon takes the form of an envelopment of one or both flanks of the small enemy position which constitutes its objective, whenever such attack is possible. Often, it will be necessary for the platoon to attack straight to the front with two or three squads in the assault echelon until an opportunity for enveloping action is presented. An enemy machine gun may be covering the ground immediately in front of the platoon, necessitating a delay until it can be knocked out with a mortar, bazooka, or grenade, or until it can be neutralized with rifle fire and smoke. A uh, first lieutenant said, The rifle grenade is another weapon that has proven its worth over here. To my mind, we should have a few more grenade launchers in each squad. They are invaluable in knocking out enemy gun emplacements and inflict heavy casualties when used properly. 
Keep in mind, when he wrote that, there were already ten grenade launchers authorized to each rifle platoon. But in the absence of one well-placed rifle grenade, one gutsy dude could get the ball rolling. In July of 1944, Lieutenant Francis Greenleaf of the 134th Infantry Regiment was leading his platoon as the point of L Company's advance through the hedgerows of Normandy. As they crossed a field, the enemy in the opposite hedgerow opened fire, and a long burst from an MG-42 in the corner caused several casualties and the entire platoon to become pinned down. Greenleaf then crawled to a fallen automatic rifleman, picked up the man's BAR, and closed with the German machine gun position by himself and wiped out its crew. At which point his platoon began moving all along the line. Each took confidence as he saw his comrades moving with him. Now they were moving in short rushes, now in long rushes from hedgerow to hedgerow. No longer was it a pair of scouts or half a squad working forward along the hedgerow. It was fire and movement all along the front. As a brief aside, I'm naturally a skeptical guy, so my first inclination is always to try and verify claims I read in these types of written accounts. If I get Rambo vibes, I want to see a corroborating record. It turns out Francis Greenleaf earned the Silver Star for that action. You can pause this screen and read the citation if you like. He actually stayed in the military until the 1970s, becoming a Major General and the 18th Chief of the National Guard Bureau. The more you know. Okay, back to business. FM 7-10 supplied this description. When the platoon comes under effective small arms fire, further advance is usually by fire and maneuver. The enemy is pinned to the ground by frontal and flanking fire, under cover of which other elements of the platoon maneuver forward, using all available cover to protect themselves against hostile fire. In turn, the original maneuvering elements may occupy firing positions and cover the advance of the elements initially firing. The squad must take advantage of every irregularity of the grounds to provide protection against hostile fire. Even in very open terrain, the well-trained riflemen will be able to locate and use all kinds of limited cover, such as slight depressions or rises. Small unit teamwork is used. Caution is taken that the men in action are always covered with some supporting fire. Each time before moving forward, survey the final objective. This way, any immediate change of the enemy's plans can be detected. Always be on the lookout for points of cover of all kinds. You'll never know when you may need it. The automatic rifle team of the support squad should assist the attacking echelon by fire if positions are available from which the automatic rifle can be fired without permanently committing it. Here's what George Wilson had to say about fire and movement in his book, If You Survive. During an attack in the Hurtgen Forest, his company and the 22nd Infantry Regiment became pinned down by machine gun fire from a well-entrenched enemy on high ground. We had all hit the ground at once, and now no one could move. Our position looked hopeless. I crawled forward until I got to the nearest platoon leader, and I told him to get his men going by fire and movement. This was slow and painful, but it seemed the only way, since we were too close for artillery support. Fire and movement is an old military technique that requires a few men to crawl or surge forward a few yards to the next cover while everyone else lays down heavy fire on the enemy to keep him occupied. The next group then scrambles forward while the others cover it with fire, and so it goes with the platoon leader directing traffic. This uses up an awful lot of ammunition and is also about the roughest thing an infantryman has to do. Casualties are sometimes high. Actually, it's suicidal to stay in place where enemy fire can seek you out. The only real safety is in getting ahead and driving off the enemy. This brings us to Phase 5. Enemy located and engaged with aimed small arms fire. The leading elements of the platoon may still be unable to see any enemy soldiers or weapons, but they are now close enough to pick out individual shadows, clumps of foliage, haystacks, windows, or doorways where enemy riflemen and machine gunners are undoubtedly concealed, and they can place effective aimed fire on these danger spots. If an enemy leaves his cover, he becomes a casualty. As soon as the platoon commences this aimed fire, the enemy is fixed. He is fixed not only physically, but mentally as well. His attention is focused on those elements which are shooting at him. Now he must be held in place by this base of fire while the rest of the platoon moves in on him from a different and unexpected direction. In the brief time available for planning his attack, the platoon leader decides the best answer to the question, how can I use my men and weapons to best possible advantage in order to accomplish my mission with the least possible delay and with the fewest casualties? He carefully studies and considers the terrain as it affords advantages or presents disadvantages for observation, fire, maneuver, protection, and concealment, both for himself and for the enemy. He decides how he will maneuver the elements of his command. 
The Infantry Journal article, Battle Drill for Squads and Platoon, detailed two basic flavors of platoon maneuver, the first being a simple envelopment. This type of flanking action allowed an attacker to place a convergent fire on a hostile position, forcing the enemy to try and defend himself from two directions at once. The tactical principles, sequence of instruction, and commands for the platoon are in general the same as for the squad. One or two squads may be used as the finding and fixing forces, with the other squad, squads, as the maneuvering element. Ideally, the point spotted the enemy before being spotted themselves, and the platoon leader could meet with his squad leaders and issue orders from a covered locality, and the platoon maneuvered into position without alerting the enemy. Alternatively, orders could be shouted above the din of battle or delivered by messenger. Provided there was adequate visibility, simple platoon tactical maneuvers could be conveyed with the standard arm and hand signals. By the book, a leader announced the location of the enemy, the scheme of maneuver, designated which part of the unit was to furnish covering fire and from where, and finally which part was to execute the maneuver along with time and route though the preference was for squad and platoon leaders to lead their maneuver elements directly with a confident follow me. The provided sequence to launch a flank attack was 1. Front. Right front. Left front. Rear. 2. Envelop right. Left. 3. First squad. There. Pointing. 4. Second and third squads. Follow me. At the command, first squad there, pointing, the first squad moves at once to the designated location and establishes a base of fire. At the command, second and third squads, follow me. The platoon leader leads the second and third squads around the right, left, to envelop the enemy's left, right, flank. The platoon guide accompanies the maneuver element to assist the platoon leader in control. The platoon sergeant normally controls the base of fire. In that example, two squads were used to assault the enemy, but that was exceptional. For starters, the platoon generally wanted as much firepower to support the maneuver as possible. If they had a section of light machine guns attached, as was often the case, then two squads in maneuver may have been more practicable, but not necessarily desirable. As enemy defenses were ordinarily arrayed in linear defilade, and attacking infantrymen assaulted in line formation, simple geometry limited the effectiveness of too large a formation closing from the flank without masking each other's fire. And only a fraction of that fire was true enfilade fire. That's fire delivered through the long axis of a target. Conversely, the squads maneuvering to the flanks weren't necessarily the assaulting force. As the field manual pointed out, from this flank position, the maneuvering squad, squads, may assist by fire the advance of the other squad, squads, or may close with the enemy. So depending upon the situation and terrain, those two maneuvering squads could become the new base of fire while the initial base of fire squad assaulted the position but ordinarily the maneuvering element was the assault element, because they were most likely to work closest to the objective. At times it was more profitable for the maneuver element to be even smaller than a squad. Frequently, the most effective method of attack is to have a small group work close to the target under cover while the remainder of the platoon's attacking echelon attacks straight to the front. A few riflemen can often work close to an enemy position without being seen over ground which affords insufficient cover for a larger group. An automatic rifleman may be included in the group. Training Bulletin GT-20, The Rifle Platoon and Squad in Offensive Combat, a pictorial supplement to FM-7-10, Part 2, The Attack, published in May of 1943, broke it down in the following way. Assuming in each case the base of fire element was able to maintain fire superiority, if there was excellent cover, two squads could be sent to outflank the enemy. If there was limited cover, one squad fixed the enemy and one squad flanked the enemy, while the support squad remained in reserve. If there was only scant cover, most of the platoon fired on the enemy while a fraction of one squad maneuvered to the flank, sending in a full squad with bayonets fixed to knock out a machine gun nest, for example, may have proven less productive than maneuvering just a few stealthy men armed with hand grenades or rifle grenades. Alright, let's see some training put to use. A platoon leader from the 39th Infantry Regiment of the 9th Infantry Division described utilizing this flanking type of fire and maneuver in his first attack in North Africa. Somehow, my platoon was still in the lead, and the company commander, who didn't know any more about combat than I did, walked up and said, Okay, move out with your platoon and take that hill. Just like in the movies. We loaded up and moved across open ground toward the hill. Giving hand signals and yelling directions, I positioned a squad on my right, one on my left, and one behind. That's the way the book said to do it, and by God, that's how I would do it. At the base of a long rise, we came under small arms fire and hit the ground. 
my first real combat. I lay there for several minutes trying to calm myself and figure out what to do. Fortunately, the unevenness of the ground gave us a little protection, and the Germans didn't seem to have mortars. I ordered one squad to crawl off to the right in a flanking movement. Now I was beginning to think. I turned so I could see my BAR man. When I give you the sign, start firing at the crest of that hill, particularly on the right where our flanking attack is going to be. Then I had to get the other two squads in action. So I established a base of fire and the BAR started firing. A heavy thumping sound. This was the first time these guys had fired their weapons in anger. I looked around and saw four or five men hunkered down, not firing. Private, I yelled. Fire your weapon. One kid squeezed the trigger, then the others started shooting. We fired up the hill for several minutes, each man firing two or three clips of ammunition. I don't know what they saw, but at least the enemy troopers were hearing a hell of a lot of bullets cracking overhead and some gun thumps in front of them. The second scheme of maneuver was a double envelopment, called pincers, which followed a similar sequence of commands. The platoon being in any formation, the commands are 1. Front, right front, left front, rear. 2. Pincers. 3. First squad, there, pointing. 4. Second squad, right. 5. Third squad, left. At the command, first squad, there, pointing, the first squad moves at once to the designated location and establishes a base of fire. At the commands, second squad, right, third squad, left, the platoon leader leads the second squad to envelop the enemy's left flank, and the platoon guide leads the third squad to envelop the enemy's right flank. It was important that the maneuvering squads didn't advance too far on both flanks, or this could become the friendly fire maneuver. They really needed to watch those angles, but if the terrain was right, it could work. In the following account, also from a soldier in the 9th Infantry Division in North Africa like my previous example, but this time from the 47th Infantry Regiment and published 63 years earlier, a platoon first executes a simple flanking attack, then launches right into the slightly more complicated pincer maneuver. We pick up the action with a rifle platoon attacking a German machine gun position located near a house on a hill 223. The first platoon leader had decided to send his squads down into the valley in a column of wedges with a five-minute interval between each squad. The mission of the first squad was to work its way around the eastern edge of the cactus patch and set up a base of fire on the Jerry machine gun while the second squad swung to the left under cover of the nose and assaulted the machine gun. The third squad was to take up firing positions on 223 to protect the exposed right flank of the platoon. As the riflemen of the first squad advanced from the stream bed up the draw to the cactus, the BAR team went into firing position to cover them. Up until this time, the first squad had not been fired upon, but as the riflemen emerged from the cactus patch, the jerrys located near the White House began to snipe. The riflemen immediately returned fire, and in a few minutes, the artillery began to smash volley after volley down on the White House. Meantime, the second squad had crossed the stream bed and was fanning out in a skirmish line just under the nose and working its way to a point where they could assault the machine gun position. At that moment, fate stepped in with a well-directed artillery shell, which landed right in the machine gun dugout, blowing the gun and gunner to kingdom come. As the second squad swept forward in their assault, the artillery fire, which had been landing barely a hundred yards in front of them, lifted. The remaining Jerry riflemen, seeing their position was hopeless, tried to pull back through the saddle but were met with a heavy fire from the first squad, and only one man succeeded in getting away. The first platoon leader could see that his third squad had now come abreast of his first and second. By hand signals, his squad leaders informed him that there were no casualties. It was time to put into execution the second part of his plan. The first squad was to push straight for the saddle. They would be covered by the second and third squads who were now down in firing positions. When the first squad got within 100 yards of the saddle or when the enemy fired on them, the first squad was to build a base of fire and cover the second and third squads as they advanced up the knobs on either flank. The first squad moved out carefully in an extended wedge formation and were within 200 yards of the saddle when they received rifle fire from the top of the left knob. The BAR team, already down in firing position, returned the fire immediately while the riflemen hit the ground and crawled into firing positions. As the volume of fire from both the enemy and the first squad increased, the second and third squads in line of skirmishers began advancing up the face of each knob in a series of short rushes. While units tried to find the enemy with the smallest force possible, once the enemy was found, the attempt to fix, fight, and finish him was continually scaled up until the desired result was achieved. If a half-squad on point could not sweep aside resistance with fire alone, it formed a base of fire to cover the riflemen as they attempted to outflank or otherwise close with the enemy. I outlined the basics of a squad attack in my first tactics video. Presuming the enemy was not immediately destroyed by fire, a squad that found itself operating alone had two main courses of action once the firefight commenced but before it ran out of ammo. It could assault or it could break contact. But a squad operating with the rest of its platoon had a third option. 
it could hold its ground and continue the fire. If all the squad's weapons were needed to gain and maintain fire superiority, the entire squad became the base of fire for an attack by fire and maneuver at the platoon level. One squad fixed the enemy while another maneuvered against him. If both squads in the assault echelon were required to gain and maintain fire superiority, the platoon leader could commit his support squad. The platoon leader hits weak spots by having his support attack the point of least resistance, or by maneuvering his support around a flank to strike the enemy with surprise fire on his flank or rear. Committing his support squad was a platoon leader's final play to alter the outcome of an engagement with his unit alone. If the entire platoon was needed to pin the enemy down, it became the base of fire element for an attack by fire and maneuver at the company level. When the advance of the platoon is stopped by hostile fire and the platoon leader has employed all means at his disposal to continue the advance, he notifies the company commander. The platoon holds the ground it has gained and starts digging foxholes. In the meantime, the advance of adjacent units may force the enemy to withdraw. But since this is not a company attack video, we'll assume our example platoon was able to gain fire superiority, or surprise, and maneuver a squad into an assault position. If ordered to attack a definitely located hostile resistance from a flank, the squad leader locates a departure position for the attack and the best covered route of approach thereto. He then moves his squad, preceded when necessary by scouts, to the position selected and endeavors to overwhelm the enemy by opening surprise fire and delivering the assault from an unexpected direction. The platoon is essentially a driving unit. Wide flanking movements by any part of the platoon are rarely practicable. However, maneuvering in the zone of an adjacent platoon is often the only feasible method for a squad or small group to approach the enemy position. A platoon leader utilizes such a route without hesitation, provided it does not interfere with the action of the adjacent unit. The field manual also stresses that if a platoon leader was maneuvering men in another platoon's zone, he needed to advise the adjacent platoon leader of the contemplated action. Before launching this maneuver, the platoon leader arranges for all possible supporting fires on the immediate enemy position and on adjacent areas where other enemy weapons may be emplaced. He also arranges for the fixing, or base of fire element of the platoon to fire faster as the maneuver commences. Remember the 5th F, Fending? As a platoon leader was maneuvering a squad against the enemy, he needed to protect his unit from enemy maneuver. Flank security patrols automatically move forward and adjust their positions to protect the flanks of the base of fire and the maneuvering elements during the attack. By taking all men for security missions from a single squad, the platoon leader retains tactical unity, keeping two complete squads intact. In this example, more than one squad was needed to keep the enemy at the bottom of their holes, so the platoon leader has shifted men from the squad on the left over to protect their exposed flank. If a single squad had been able to gain fire superiority, the support squad could provide flank security while another squad maneuvered to the enemy's flank. But in this situation, the support squad has been committed to conduct the assault. Phase 6. Assault. Pursuit by fire. Reorganization. The maneuvering riflemen have now arrived within rushing distance of an enemy firing position. This may be any distance up to 100 yards. It should not exceed that approximate distance for two reasons. First, because too long a rush will exhaust the troops and they will need all their energy when they arrive on the objective. Second, because the assault must be completed rapidly to take full advantage of the short period of intense supporting fire when the enemy has his head down for a few seconds. Troops must close with the enemy suddenly, fight and finish him, and get under cover before adjacent hostile groups can collect themselves and open accurate fire. Squad leaders do not give commands so loudly that the enemy might hear them and learn some new action is beginning. They make full use of arm and hand signals. The signal to commence firing is usually given for the benefit of the second in command. Both leaders should then give commence firing in a normal tone of voice. Men in firing positions do not look to the rear for signals to commence firing. The assault may take place either on the orders of the platoon leader or as part of a general assault ordered by the company or battalion commander. The attacking echelon works its way as close as it can get to the hostile position without masking supporting fires machine gun, mortar, infantry howitzer, artillery, and sometimes aircraft. For a platoon assault, the prearranged signal for the lifting of supporting fires is given by the platoon leader. Before lifting supporting fires, the platoon leader must increase the rate of fire of his own weapons in order to maintain fire superiority. He commands or signals to the squad leaders and men near him to fire faster. He may emphasize this order by firing several rounds rapidly himself. All other members of the platoon should promptly take up the rapid fire in order to completely neutralize the enemy to the front. 
At this time, rifle grenadiers and rocket launcher teams should blind and neutralize located enemy automatic weapons to the flanks by firing smoke grenades at them. The platoon leader then, at the critical moment, shifts supporting fires from in front of the platoon and signals his squads to move forward in the assault. It was imperative that there was a smooth handover of fire superiority. Once the platoon's base of fire element shifted its fire to avoid endangering friendly forces on or near the objective, the enemy still had to remain fixed. So at that point, the volume of fire from the assaulting element needed to reach Hollywood levels. The platoon must arrive then in the final assault position with the maximum of ammunition of all types still in the hands of the troops. Furthermore, once the rate of fire is increased to the maximum rate, the assault must be completed as rapidly as possible before too much ammunition is expended. Now let us think for a moment in terms of economy of ammunition. This intense volume of fire cannot be maintained for long and is limited by the amount the troops can carry when they move forward in the attack. It cannot be maintained at all if we expend our ammunition prematurely at a time when it is absolutely essential. That is why each commander moves as close to the enemy as possible before resorting to the fire of his own organic weapons for support. The quantity of ammunition carried by a rifleman varied depending upon the situation, but an American rifleman tended to carry a lot more individual ammunition than his counterparts from other countries, who instead tended to carry a lot of ammunition for their squad's LMG. When discussing ammo supply, terms like unit of fire or day of supply are often thrown around. These were macro-level concepts, interesting to logisticians, but at this level you want to look at things like basic load and initial supply. A unit's basic load referred to how much ammunition was kept on hand for each weapon. According to FM 101-10, the battalion ammunition train, which was not actually a locomotive, just trucks from the regimental service company, transported a reserve of four bandoliers of ammunition for each M1 in a rifle platoon. According to that manual, in addition to the clips habitually carried in a rifleman's cartridge belt, an initial supply of two bandoliers was to be issued as extra ammunition prior to combat with two bandoliers held in reserve. But as the infantry school mailing list pointed out, the amount of ammunition to be issued to each rifleman is a command decision, normally made by the battalion commander, since frequently it is impracticable to replenish rifle ammunition for frontline units during daylight. One solution is to direct the distribution of four bandoliers, 192 rounds, to each rifleman in the companies of the attacking echelon, and two, 96 rounds, to those in the reserve company. This leaves a small reserve. Wilfred Barber, who commanded Abel Company of the 331st Infantry, describing his experience in Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge, mentioned, The rifleman carried four bandoliers of ammunition extra, along with two hand grenades and one clip of BAR ammunition. This was SOP within the company. 30-06 is not light, but some soldiers carried up to six bandoliers on occasion. Recalling a 1945 attack, J.A. Kraft said, I was lugging a half dozen bandoliers, grenades, and they weighed me down. Even four bandoliers may seem like a lot of grand food to carry, but assaults made M1s hungry. The assault proper could commence at a set time, or on the signal or command of the platoon leader, but frequently in the heat of battle, the assault is started on the initiative of a squad or even of a few individuals. Wherever and whenever the assault begins, it should receive the immediate cooperation of every individual and unit within sight. When the assault is launched, assault fire may be employed on the defender's position to keep it under fire and prevent the enemy from manning his defenses. Assault fire involved the assault element getting online and just blasting its way steadily toward the objective, the shock action that the manual spoke about. If the enemy was caught by surprise, the results of such an attack could be devastating. The following account by the leader of 3rd Platoon, Abel Company, 504th, details an assault against a distracted platoon-sized enemy group caught in the flank. The first squad would be disposed with the platoon leader in the middle, a Browning automatic rifle team on each flank, and the squad leader and assistant squad leader on either side of the platoon leader midway to each flank. The platoon leader set a slow pace, as the success of the assault depended on a steady advance all the way to the objective. The fire of the skirmish line picked up quickly, each weapon firing, and the noise of the automatic and semi-automatic fire all but drowned out the sound of the enemy fire. As the enemy fire became heavier, and the range closed, the skirmish line tended to bend back at the flanks, but the aggressive firing of the Browning automatic rifle gunners on the flank extremities and the exhortations of the leaders brought the flanks on line again. The platoon leader saw that the Germans were not dug in, but were firing from prone positions behind the trees. 
The progress of the line became slower as individuals advanced a step or two, fired two or three aimed shots, and advanced again, each man firing at those Germans most threatening him. The Browning automatic rifle gunners fired from the hip, aiming by their tracers, and in spite of the confusion carefully returned empty magazines to their belts. The line was building up fire superiority and continuing to move in. The platoon leader fired occasionally with his carbine, but gave his attention to his formation and the actions of the enemy as much as possible. As he moved abreast of the right lead scout, the scout's helmet flew off and he slapped his head as though he had been stung. A stream of blood an inch in diameter arched from his temple and continued to run like an open spigot, melting a hole in the snow. The skirmish line almost halted as the men fired flat-footed into the nearest Germans who were only a few feet away, some returning the fire, some already dead. On the right, a German crawled forward, pushing an MG-34 ahead of him in the snow, and was killed as he tried to put it into action. A second German, moving as though in a trance, tried to man the gun, but it was kicked from his hands, and he was killed as he reached for it a second time. In this assault, the U.S. platoon had one KIA and three wounded, while only one enemy soldier, their medic, managed to escape. The Germans were caught out in a terrible position, but even then, had they been able to reorient that machine gun, the record of this engagement probably wouldn't have been written in English. Assault fire was best reserved for a weak or wavering enemy, especially when the defenders were primarily armed with bolt actions, while the attackers were primarily armed with semi-autos, but it wasn't a one-size-fits-all solution. The 1943 book, Combat Problems for Small Units, laid out the options of an example squad leader. Sergeant Jones considered three courses of action. To continue the fire from the present position with all weapons, to advance the entire squad using assault fire, to advance by two-man rushes. The first course is safest, but already the march has been delayed and there is no assurance that fire alone will drive the Germans out. Assault fire may be premature, and the squad may receive heavy casualties if the enemy detail is not actually withdrawing. By rushes, the point will push toward the enemy and there will still be sufficient volume of fire to shake Nazi accuracy against the moving Americans. The procedure by which a squad advanced by rushes of individuals or small groups during fire and movement was demonstrated in the War Department training film TF-7-393, titled Battle Formations Part 1 Rifle Squad, released in 1942. But a training bulletin published in September of 1943 cautioned instructors to ignore segments of that film. Certain parts of TF-7-393 are obsolete and should not be shown. In particular, TF-7-393 is an error in the method of advancing one or two men at a time when a squad or platoon is firing. It shows men moving forward from positions in the center of the skirmish line. This is dangerous and would result in the lowering of firepower since other members of the squad must cease fire to avoid hitting their own men. The correct method is for men on the flanks to move forward singly or by rushes of two or more, so as to permit the men in position to continue their fire. If there are substantial obstacles in the way of the assault, barbed wire, anti-personnel mines, dense jungle growth, or steep mountainsides, the length of the assault must be greatly reduced. It may have to be completed by creeping and crawling from one bit of cover to the next. For those viewers more familiar with modern terminology, creeping is now called the high crawl, and crawling is the low crawl. So, while many a training problem may have ended with glorious assault fire, the bounding type of fire and movement was often what was needed during an assault against prepared and stubbornly held enemy defenses, as seen in this combat lesson from the 37th Infantry Division. A direct assault, launched from as close as 30 yards against an emplaced enemy in the Hill 700 action was proven to be too costly in manpower, even when launched from three directions simultaneously against an island of resistance, 40 yards by 40 yards, it was not successful and resulted in too many casualties. Close adherence to the principles of fire and movement, with careful use of cover and concealment until the attacking elements have completely passed through the positions was found to be the solution. So whether by walking, rushing, or crawling, the assault was carried through the enemy position. At a certain point, the base of fire element needed to cease firing, lest they shoot their own men. Once the assaulting element fought its way through the objective, the rest of the platoon displaced forward. According to a platoon leader quoted in Combat Lessons Number 5, When moving forward in the attack, we normally move farther than Jerry's old positions, because the minute he knows you're in his old foxholes, he can zero in on you with his mortars and 88s. Now the platoon could consolidate and reorganize. The consolidation of a position and the reorganization of units are separate and distinct procedures which usually take place simultaneously. 
Consolidation of a position means organizing and strengthening a newly captured position so that it can be used against the enemy. Reorganization means replacing casualties, reassigning men if necessary, replenishing ammunition supply, rendering reports, and so forth. At the conclusion of the assault, some weapons are immediately pushed forward to fire upon the retiring enemy as well as to resist counterattack. Other hostile groups and machine guns are probably entrenched nearby. Counterattack must be guarded against, and the attack continued as soon as possible. As the attack progresses, the platoon leader affects reorganization as casualties occur. Leaders and scouts are replaced. Ammunition from dead and wounded is collected and redistributed. A message is sent to the company commander stating the effective strength of the platoon and the status of ammunition supply. Prisoners are sent to the company command post. When a man went down in the middle of an attack, individual infantrymen were told the best way to put distance between a wounded man and the enemy was not to drag the casualty out, but to beat back the threat. It was the aid man's primary task to treat the wounded. It was the rifleman's priority to keep his weapon in the fight. If your buddy gets hit on a push, don't go after him. There will be a medic along in a few minutes, and you can do more good by helping push the enemy farther away from where he got hit. If it is not a push when your buddy gets hit, give him immediate first aid. With regard to reorganization after sustaining significant casualties, instructions were... A squad of even five men remains an effective fighting unit or team so long as it includes a competent leader, an automatic rifleman, and a rifle grenadier. A squad so reduced in strength as to be ineffective should be combined with another squad, or its personnel distributed among the other squads. Interestingly, that was the exact composition of the Alpha Bravo teams when symmetrical fire teams were adopted by the Army in the mid-1950s. As covered in my previous tactics video, there weren't four F's when it came to handling POWs, but four S's. Search, segregate, silence, and speed. For a rifle platoon after an assault, the most pressing S was the first one. Search. The enemy needed to be disarmed, even if he appeared dead. And captives were thoroughly searched for concealed weapons. Prisoners are disarmed at once. They are separated into three groups. Officers, non-commissioned officers, and privates. Officers and then other prisoners are searched for documents and other papers. The prisoner's name is placed on the documents removed from him and the documents given to the guard conducting the prisoners to the company command post. Phase 7. Continuation of the attack. Upon capture of the initial objective, the platoon leader makes a quick personal reconnaissance and promptly issues orders for renewal of the attack. A platoon in the attacking echelon does not delay the advance to clean up isolated points of resistance but leaves them to be reduced by succeeding echelons. Every effort is made to press the attack without pause. Phases 3, 4, 5, and 6 usually will be repeated several times before the platoon either reaches its assigned objective or is forced to stop temporarily and organize for defense. Phase 8. Organization and defense of ground. Unless the attack is to be resumed almost immediately, the platoon should dig in to be prepared to meet a hostile counterattack. This immediate counterattack is a typical habit of the Germans, and one against which all U.S. troops should be on guard. The platoon now organizes to hold what it has. It will never have time to waste. Within five minutes, local security should have been posted, and all individuals should have selected hasty firing positions and fields of fire. In 15 minutes or less, the platoon leader should have perfected detailed dispositions, and the men should start to dig. Within one hour, counterattacks permitting, all personnel should have either sitting-type foxholes or shallow-prone firing trenches, depending on the hardness of the ground. Improvements of the position will continue indefinitely. Much more on that score whenever it is I get around to making a defensive tactics video. But before wrapping up this video, I wanted to discuss withdrawal. Say the platoon couldn't gain or maintain fire superiority, ammo was running low and there was no assistance on the way, maybe the plan changed and the platoon was needed elsewhere, or the company commander simply didn't want to get drawn in any deeper, so the platoon received orders to pull back. There were of course some set procedures for withdrawal. The platoon being in any formation, the commands are 1. Withdraw to there, pointing. 2. First, second, and third squads in turn. 3. First squad, follow me. Squads may be withdrawn in any order. At the command, first squad, follow me, the platoon leader conducts the first squad to the new position and establishes a base of fire to cover the withdrawal of the second and third squads. When fire is not open from the new position, a flare or other signal is given to the platoon sergeant to withdraw the second and third squads. 
As an alternate method, the BAR teams were left in position under the command of the platoon sergeant to cover the withdrawal of the rest of the platoon. The remainder of the platoon, led by the platoon leader, established a new base of fire position. They then covered the withdrawal of the automatic rifle teams, who were careful not to mask the fire. When the withdrawal was over, the BAR teams rejoined their squads. So whether the platoon was trying to establish contact or break contact, it always had men in position ready to cover the element in movement. As I briefly touched upon in my previous tactics video, the squad withdrew much the same way, only with two elements bounding backward instead of three. In a withdrawal, the squad supports one team with another from successive locations until disengagement is effected. When he receives orders to withdraw, the squad leader gives his orders covering these points to his men. 1. Location of the enemy. 2. Plan of withdrawal to include routes, successive positions, and details as to rate and distribution of fire. 3. Which team will furnish initial covering fire and where it will fire from. 4. Time and route by which covering force will fall back. 5. Designation of assembly area. After the orders are given, the two leaders will take charge of their teams and begin the withdrawal as planned. The two leaders mentioned here were the squad leader and the assistant squad leader. So I'll note again that even in January of 1945, when the squad was officially organized into Abel, Baker, and Charlie teams, it was doctrine to fight as two teams, ordinarily Abel merging with Baker, forming two half squads. Depending upon the situation, the squad could also disengage using a technique known as thinning the line, as instructed in FM 7-10. Individuals are sent to the rear, thinning the squad as rapidly as possible. Those left in position cover this withdrawal. The squad leader withdraws with the last man in the squad, usually the automatic rifleman. The men retire from cover to cover, taking advantage of defilated routes. The first individuals could in turn cover the withdrawal of the troops in contact, or proceed directly to the rallying point with the second in command. In summary, that is the platoon's eye view of war. The battalion, the regiment, and the division may be engaged in a reconnaissance in force, a brilliant double envelopment, a masterly withdrawal from action, or relentless pursuit. But to the rifle platoon, it is just phases one to eight, over and over again. And platoons wouldn't necessarily hit each phase in order, or at all. Sometimes a platoon passes suddenly from phase 1 to phase 4 or 5 in 15 seconds, a meeting engagement, the book says. Sometimes it passes clear from phase 1 to 8 without a fight at all. A platoon leader in the 89th Infantry Division wrote about sweeping through eastern Germany in April of 1945 against rapidly crumbling defenses. The Germans were deployed in depth. They could have delayed us. Instead, they surrendered in small groups. The platoon maintained its rapid march. If my command did not induce enemy soldiers to surrender, I dispatched a rifle team to influence them, and I kept the platoon moving. At one point I told myself that if I continued to send out rifle teams, I wouldn't have a platoon left. The teams never had to fire a shot. Either the Germans were waiting to surrender, or the initial surrenders led the others to surrender as well. I told myself that the German army was falling apart. Suddenly, a group of Germans sprang to their feet with their hands in the air. They were at the edge of the woods directly to my right. My scouts had missed them and so had I. I looked at them and was thankful they were not in a fighting mood. I motioned them to the rear with my thumb. A platoon could also pass from phase 1 right to phase 8 if it had a terrain objective and the enemy bugged out before there was any contact, as seen in this 1945 letter from a squad leader to the infantry journal. Going up front and into an attack can't adequately be described. You have to learn by doing. It may be a big Cecil B. DeMille production with plenty of fireworks or it may be nothing more than an approach march. In some attacks here in Italy, we've taken a hill with the men smoking pipes and munching sea ration cookies. When it was all over, a new replacement would say, Say, Sarge, when are we going to attack? So to wrap things up, the important thing is for the platoon leader to recognize each phase as it develops and take the necessary action. In battle, the company or battalion will sometimes make coordinated attacks against located enemy positions. But most of the time, between these brief moments of coordinated action, the platoon will stumble in and out of phases 1 to 8 very informally, all alone, and quite regardless of the company or battalion picture. And with that, we've reached phase 9, the end.